Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. We're here down at the uh, studios in downtown Honolulu. Ted Ralston here sitting in for Jay Fidel, who I will say has asked me to sit in for him more than once now. And this looks like it might be something permanent. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, apologize to those who expected to see Jay on here. Uh, as you know, we talked about this and said, Jay, what's, uh, what expense do you go to for this audience on your show? He said, no expense is too good for this show. So we went to absolutely that, no expense for his uh, stand-in replacement here. The summer replacement for Jay Fidel. We got two guests, the uh, same two we had on last time. So if you look, if these guys look like veterans, they are. Uh, Doug Martin, Dr. Ken Kaneshiro, and we're expecting one more to join us shortly. What we're talking about is the road to the future uh, here in Hawaii and frankly around the world and how Hawaii's leadership in the world of technology can help make that road paved well for all of us. One thing that my wife did as we were driving in today is we just took a look at uh, some of the word history here. The word technology, we often think of as cell phones or electronic boards or fast airplanes or 180 dB sound systems in our cars or whatever, but technology really, it, the root word comes from the art, the art of applying tools to problems and in a way that improves the solution of the problem, improves the human condition, improves something. So technology is really stems from art, which allows us then to think of the broad perspective of technology rather than just a specific element of like structural technology or materials or something like that. So our show will try to embrace the broadest range of technology and that goes all the way from physical things, which you don't see on the table here, to the abstract, which is uh, thinking and how decisions are made, which is a really important aspect of where the Hawaii leadership can be. And if anybody really wants to dig into this deeper, there's a great book by James Gleick, G-L-E-I-C-H. It's called The Information, and it is an absolutely wonderful treasure trove of information, of information about information. So with that, uh, we'll go just a, a quick review of what we talked about last week. We talked about the State of Hawaii Exemplary State Program, which is a way to provide a systems look at how we interrelate here in the state in terms of the infrastructure, the culture, education, the economy, uh, and, and the, the basic feelings and the qualities of life. Um, we talked about how that is a, a, an opportunity for Hawaii. We talked about it from an environmental perspective. Ken took us through some of that. We'd like to extend that discussion today, and Doug took us through how that relates to sustainability and resilience at the end state, which is maybe one of the stronger value statements here. We'd like to take a look a little, a little bit at, at the systems aspects of this uh, in terms of how to look at Hawaii as a system. And um, we'll expect it to be another, seri another uh, episode in this uh, series later on, but just starting from that at the very base level, uh, Dr. Kaneshiro has been spending some time thinking about systems and we can work back and forth here and pull out what those key elements are. So Ken, if you will, tell us a little bit of how you've been thinking about Exemplary State and Hawaii from a systems perspective. Thanks, Ted, um, and thanks for having me back again this week. Um, actually, to tell you the truth, I'm, I'm really a neophyte in systems thinking, but it's, well, we it's, are. it's, it's so. this idea of Exemplary State and how we integrate so many different components of society and how they're all interdependent to each other. You know, things like education and power and energy, food, culture, community, you know, um, government, civil defense, all of those things are all really interrelated and interdependent of each other. And unless we have better communication among those organizations, individuals that are doing things in these different areas, communicate, you know, better and have more coordinated action, uh, we won't be able to be as successful in um, sustainability, resilience uh, issues in, in Hawaii and in, at the global level. So this is why I think the systems thinking approach is so important as we go on into the future in thinking about uh, how we're gonna sustain our, our communities and, and ourselves um, in, in an island ecosystem like Hawaii. If you take that very abstract concept of systems thinking, uh, what are the first steps people listening to this program might want to take? By the way, anybody listening to this program or watching it is welcome to tell us what you think of it. You're also welcome to tell us which subjects you think should be on and additional uh, uh, participants should be at the, at the panel level. And uh, Zuri Bender, a little bit later, will tell us uh, how to provide that input to us. But 
going back to Ken's point, systems thinking is something new to a lot of people. It was new to you. It's uh, new to a lot of us. We generally think of the little thing we deal with, or our assignment, our task, our orders. System thinking goes beyond that. Give us your first thoughts on what that means and what people listening to this might might start thinking about on their, yeah, on their side. You know, perhaps um, a way to sort of explain, as you said, this abstract, somewhat complex uh, way to think is to give one example. And um, <clears throat> uh, I started to work on this project uh, called, um, you know, looking at biomass for uh, um, alternative energy. And we uh, started to work on this project, which we were calling the Biochar Project. It's what it is, it's, a, it's not a new technology. It's actually an ancient charcoal making technology, but um, there's a scientific terminology called pyrolysis and so on. And uh, what it is, is taking biomass, which is any organic matter that you can actually burn in some way. But rather than, you know, the gases that's produced by this uh, uh, incomplete combustion being given off into the atmosphere, you know, contribute to the greenhouse gas effect. You, 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 you do this in a closed system so that the, the gases are then burned further to produce energy, electricity, or you can produce biodiesel fuel and things like that. But the byproduct of that is charcoal. The biochar is another component of this technology which can be used as a soil amendment and when you do that, you can enhance agriculture productivity by 100%. At the same time, if you're actually using it as a soil amendment, you're actually sequestering carbon because it's 70 to 90% pure carbon, charcoal is. So here you're talking about <clears throat> energy, you're talking about food security, you're talking about carbon sequestration. Furthermore, because you've got sort of activated charcoal that you're putting into the soil, you can actually enhance water quality by purifying the water that goes down into the ground water system, you know, before it picks up any um, impurities, pollutants, and so on. So it has impact on water quality as well. Uh, there's also a public health component. Uh, if you were to deploy this technology in some of the remote villages in Indonesia, Southeast Asia, where the women and children are going out into the forest collecting wood, biomass, to be able to cook inside of their huts over an open flame, literally 100 to 150,000 women and children annually are contracting lung disease in this area. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to deploy this biochar technology that, we, that I've been talking about, where you can have a, a biochar unit, they're collecting biomass anyway, the whole village is, the women and children, put into this single chamber, hook it up to a generator, you can actually provide clean energy so to speak, which is not giving off greenhouse gas um, emissions to every, every hut in the village so that they're not cooking over an open flame. So, you know, you're actually being able to reduce public health, you know, lung disease issues in these areas. So that's, that's how I started to think about a systems thinking approach. It's not just energy, but it's also food, it's water, it's environment, you know, public health might be involved as well. And it, it all tees up or trees up to a figure of merit that's really important to us, which is public health. Yeah. We'll get Dr. Skip Burkle on at some point in time, and he will absolutely echo that, mm -hmm. that, that thought. So what you defined is something that cuts across a lot of disciplinary domains, and maybe even uh, administrative domains, government domains, and this sort of thing. We talk about energy, we talk about agriculture. They're normally not seen in the same uh, political box. So in the Western style of thinking that we've generated bureaucracy so that you can keep these things from interfecting, in affecting each other, now we want to cause them to affect each other in a positive way. Right. What would we do to take on biochar as a task here or in some Pacific Island or some other location tomorrow? Yeah, uh, I mean, again, I think <clears throat> this technology, and I know Doug is working with another company now that is planning a very large scale operation in producing biochar and so on. But th this whole technology is very scalable. You can do it from a single household to an entire village or you know, millions of gallons of biodiesel fuel that could be produced. Um, but that, that's the beauty of this uh, technology is that it can be a very distributed system. You, know, you can have it in single household or 
you know, uh, uh, small villages or big townships or, or perhaps even the whole state mm -hmm. in which this company is probably going to be able to provide alternative biodiesel fuel to HECO and other um, um, energy producing company while as an alternative to fossil fuel. What you've identified in your discussion so far is some of the characteristics of a system that has measurable characteristics, in this case public health, in this case energy, in this case agricultural supplement. Those are a couple of things that could be right. measured coming out of this. You've talked about coupling. There's these, these pieces are related to each other. Exactly. They're also related to the economic system in some way right. and uh, education and, and training. So uh, again, it's, it's a new way to think about things. It goes beyond the disciplines we've all trained in. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so training and education and awareness in the systems domain is, is probably as equally important as understanding what systems are all about right now. Yeah, absolutely. So how would we, how would we get a, a two minutes or so before we take the first break, how would we, again, uh, build up a test case or build up a sample case or a prototype or something like that right here? Yeah, I and mean, again, we started we, we started a discussion last week where we um, talked about how we would engage the K-12 community, K-12 schools, um, in, in the system thinking approach to gathering the kinds of data and information that government agencies like General Wong, uh, who's the commander of civil defense, uh, could use those kinds of information for more informed, better decision making. And so, it, you know, that, that's really, to me, the, the best way to engage the community, get the kids involved, and you're also training the next generation of leaders. So we'd want to have some kind of a, uh, a, a structured information collection system that would give you the insight as to where we're, say, falling down today and where we could go tomorrow if we could implement some of these system and, and ahupua'a-wide thinking. Right, absolutely, yeah. So that's, that's the other part of that um, education component is to have a place-based STEM research education of relevance. So it's, rele it's collecting data and information that's relevant to the ahupua, the watershed in which these schools are located. Okay, let's uh, take a break at this point in time and come back in a, in a little bit and talk about the development and the resilience okay. side that Doug is thinking about and how that plays off this idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is Think Tech, and one of our favorite shows is Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy. And it, it uh, goes four to five every Wednesday right here from Think Tech uh, in Pioneer Plaza at the core of downtown Honolulu. And my co-host is Ray Starling from Hawaii Energy. Ray, do you like the show? I love the show. It's, uh, it's great to see all the new people coming in with new ideas about how to save energy, get us off of fossil fuel and that's what it's all about. So Hawaii, the state of clean energy, uh, see us on Wednesday afternoons at four o'clock. I knew he'd say that. Thanks, Ray. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. Come and watch Catching Up with Kaka'ako every Wednesday, 3 to 4 p.m. We'll introduce you to developers, uh, to residents, to designers and architects, officials, and regular people, all of whom are involved in the development of Kaka'ako, who care about it passionately, and who are part of the community that will ultimately live, work, learn, and play there. Come and see Catching Up in Kaka'ako, 3 to 4 p.m. every Wednesday. Thanks. I'll see you there. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii at the studios in downtown Honolulu. Uh, Ted Ralston here with our panel. Uh, where the road leads, the road to the future, what we're all about here, technology as an art, technology applied to the improvement of the total quality of, uh, of the human condition here in Hawaii and, and the Pacific. We've been joined by Dr. Herb Lee from the Pacific America Foundation who is, uh, has an interesting, a lot of interesting perspectives in this very area. And uh, we'll get to Herb in a minute, but we wanted to transition from where Ken was taking us on the definition of systems and how you, maybe how you collect information and how you perhaps even measure the results of a system. Let's roll that over all the way to the end, which is the execution side, the development side, and how, you, how this plays out in the world of empowerment and resilience. And mm -hmm. Doug Martin's in the middle of that type of thinking process. So can you relate for us what Ken's been saying into how we turn these into programs? Yes, certainly I can. 
uh, and I appreciate that opportunity to discuss that, that topic because that's so critical in development thinking now. Uh, there's been a real transition in development going from the concept of development being no more than just putting projects in place to a systems approach to thinking. And paralleling what Ken discussed in terms of the systems approach, the, the outlay of, of the scientific research and the implementation of, of the various people who are involved in collecting data and putting projects in place, looking at the broader scale of how this happens in terms of the entire community and specifically in the funding, how are these how are these projects actually or how are projects put in place to implement this kind of uh, technology in, in terms of the enhancement of the future. The systems approach is just as applicable in this regard in the sense that any kind of real meaningful change, anything that would constitute development in the sense that you're talking about of empowerment, needs to include numerous various constituencies. First of all, it has to include the public sector, which is the government. In the case here we're talking about in Hawaii, that would be civil defense as well. Anyone who is part of the public sector which represents the people. It's also the policies and the laws that, that govern the land. The second area would be the commercial sector because no project or no kind of activity is really have any, has any possibility of being sustainable if it's not commercially viable. Um, I think uh, development has shown that there's been a lot of activities that have well intended with good purpose and good, in, uh, good involvement of knowledgeable people without a sustainable business plan in place, they never go any further than the actual uh, involvement of the people who are implementing them. So the business community, the commercial sector is, is critical. We had mentioned last week about involving technology in the implementation of technology here in Hawaii and involving Hawaiian, Hawaiian businesses to employ Hawaiians in these jobs, but also to bring technology innovation and developers here as well, so that that reflects what we're actually implementing. The third sector is the civil society, which re involves all of the, the NGOs and organizations that really represent the conscience of the people and the community. And it involves things like uh, family involvement, women's empowerment, cultural enhancement, and anything that really deals with the welfare of the community. And the last, the fourth uh, constituency that needs to be involved is academia. Of course, Ken spe spoken eloquently of academia, not only at the university level and graduates, but also from K on the, all the way up. So it's actually every level of that. And that would also include lifelong learning, uh, education in the broadest sense. So it's by bringing these four constituencies together that we have a system, an integrated systems approach in terms of the people involved as well, which parallels very nicely with the, the concept of the systems implementation of technology. So that's fascinating. We have the physical aspects and the, and the measurable aspects that Ken has discussed, which have biology and, and various uh, disciplines and science associated with them. But that works only in concert with the, the social side, which includes mm -hmm. government, includes culture, how people feel, and mm -hmm. self-esteem, and factors such as that. The two that have to go together. The system some, needs to be holistic. So the question then becomes, how do we define these interconnections, and how do we evaluate the strengths or find the weaknesses mm -hmm. in something that buckles those two together? And we'll turn to Herb Lee in a minute and ask for some thoughts in that regard. But I think first we'd like to introduce uh, Zuri Bender, and uh, she'll tell us a little bit about how people viewing this show can give us feedback in terms of uh, subjects they'd like to have uh, discussed, uh, folks they want to recommend for our discussions, and just in general how we're doing. So, Zuri? Yes, you know, we would love to hear what everybody has to say about the show, if you'd like to be a guest, or just improve Think Tech Hawaii productions in general. You can always contact us on Twitter at ThinkTechHI. We're also on Instagram, ThinkTechHI. You can always tag us in your photos, or you can find us on Facebook and communicate at Think Tech Hawaii. You can like us and go ahead and communicate that way. You can always visit us at www.thinktechhawaii.com and contact us to learn more about the studios. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Zuri, and I hope people out there take an active interest and stir the pot and give us all the feedback they can. So Herb, last time, last week we met, we had uh, Ken and Doug on the show and we talked about the Hawaii Exemplary State 
uh, program that you and I have discussed it at several times in the past. And what we've devolved this into is uh, the thoughts about interdependence, the thought about loosely coupled and tightly coupled aspects of systems. We've talked about it in the terms that we were all raised, which is engineering or science or something, and Doug bring it, brings in the economic aspect. But in discussions you and I have had in the past, we've talked about the linguistic component or the cognitive component in terms of traditional thinking versus Western thinking. What we just expressed here was Western thinking, in, if you will, in bureaucratic ways. And we here's the West trying to figure out how to put things together as a system. But the thinking you've been doing and the research you've been doing might say there's traditional thinking that's already at the systems level that we need to see how it comes together uh, with what we're talking about here. So without uh, giving you much chance to think about this in advance, Herb, <laughs> you're on camera. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Ted. Um, you know, how, I think Hawaii does have something very unique to offer the world. Um, and because, you know, our uh, Hawaiian uh, forefathers, our ancestors, you know, living in the middle of the Pacific, probably the most isolated place in the world, you know, they had, a, they had hundreds of years to figure out how to balance finite resources in the middle of the Pacific and be sustainable and thrive at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting that now, you know, throughout the country, throughout the world, that we're having this discussion regarding the value of indigenous knowledge, not only in Hawaii, but in indigenous peoples of the world that still are closely connected to the land. Um, and looking at um, the, the intersection between traditional ecological knowledge and how that um, integrates with Western science. And I believe that uh, the solutions that we're looking for, taking the example of Hawaii as a state with finite resources, as a place of finite resources, and how to extrapolate those, uh, that wisdom and that knowledge on a global basis, um, I think is very transferable uh, and, 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 yeah. and probably wise. And, and the fact that um, there's a great intersection between uh, the traditional ecological knowledge, or what we call TEK wisdom, and Western science, mm -hmm. the solutions lie in both worlds. And we need to figure out better ways on how to integrate <coughs> those two and not devalue either, either one, mm -hmm. but really celebrate those and really look at the successes of those, um, that, that knowledge and wisdom, and figure out ways to creatively apply it. And what mm -hmm. we've been doing, um, going back to what Kent said, is you know looking at the K-12 system because we had some ideas about how to make some of those transformative changes and, and make those connections at the high school level, but we very quickly realized that imagine if we could transform and inspire learners when they're even in the pre-K, you know, to begin to get exposed to the elements and understand the importance of connection to place, yeah. right? And the value of place, and imagine if they grew up in a system where that knowledge was scaffolded and we were able to integrate both of those things, measure those things, and continue to have dialogue in terms of how do we integrate, um, do integrated interdisciplinary learning in all of the core areas, and be able to translate that into meaningful ways to solve problems mm -hmm. in our communities that you guys talked mm -hmm. about, from a systems level, from a development level, and taking you know a very holistic approach, mm -hmm. as you said, Doug. I really believe in that. You know, looking at learning of holistically and looking at all of the components that contribute to a, a holistic learning journey for our kids, and to, to the extent that we can ground them in those kinds of beliefs and sciences and practices, traditional and and modern then we are all going to be better off. And we, as uh, Hawaiian people, have known how to do that uh, from a traditional standpoint. And we're, you know, there are a lot of people that are actively returning to that knowledge within a very simple ahupua'a management mm -hmm. concept mm -hmm. because it's doable, right? Mm -hmm. It's doable from the mountain to the sea. It's, you know, uh, and we learn so much. And I think, you know, that, that knowledge is so trans, uh, transformative for for kids that have lost that connection, or mm -hmm. even for us that have lost that connection to place, but then be able to now take that wisdom and become the global citizens that we hope that we can be. That's a great, uh, a great thought. And, and when you say ahupua'a level, Ken just so happens to have here a, a, a graphic that might be useful to see how that thought turns into some real steps. Yeah, We've yeah I, I don't know whether we can capture this on screen, but this is a map of um, the Alawai watershed, the Ahupua there. And what this is, is a 100-year flood. Oh. 
So if there is a rainfall that um, produces enough rain up in the mountains to flood the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the entire watershed, you can see in the blue there how much of this Alawai watershed is going to be flooded out. You know, the, the tourism industry is going to be affected, um, all of the residential areas and so on, the university. You know, in, in, the, in 2004, the uh, Halloween flood that yeah. we had a few years ago, um, and that wasn't even a 30-year flood. It was a fairly small flood, and yet it caused a $90 million damage in Upper Manoa, uh, with $80 million of that coming at the University of Hawaii. So, I mean, if you had a 100-year flood and it flooded the, the uh, watershed the way this, this figure shows, um, the, the impact is going to be huge, uh, not just with you know, homes have been destroyed and so on, but the whole um, tourism industry is going to be severely impacted. So, again, you know, you got to think about the system, you know, from Ahupua, right. from the top of the mountain into the coral reef ecosystem, in order to really address sustainability, resilience issues. So, an interesting thought then would be to work with this sort of thing in the K-12, K-12 group. Yep. Uh, I noticed that three of the four of us here have a lot of white hair, and, and one doesn't have that problem, which means if you went to the to the pharmacy, I suspect, and bought something to fix no, the problem. No. But <laughs> uh, we need to uh, take this sort of thing and turn it into a program that would that the kids can be part of because they're going to be the ones who are there in a hundred year flood, not us. And uh, maybe take a look at it from a traditional perspective, Herb, as well, in terms of how uh, resilience in the way the settlements would have occurred would have ge been generated in order to avoid the adverse consequences here. We've come in from a Western perspective and maybe generated the adverse issues that are going to result in the, the problems we're seeing here. Let's, uh, uh, let me oh, just follow yeah. up on something Herb said here about, I think that's really key about the integration of uh, talking systems approach again, yeah. indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge, for lack of a better term. Right. There's a sense of those from the Western knowledge tradition that what they have done has created a sense of knowledge that has replaced or superseded, has gone beyond traditional knowledge and that traditional knowledge is not as important or not relevant. It's, it's relegated to a historic concept. And looking at human cognitive ability from a systems approach, it's, it's critical that we look at both. Right. Because what we've developed in terms of the knowledge we've generated through technology is an incredibly additive force onto traditional knowledge that really extends the reach of human uh, uh, academic and intellectual potential. And it's not one or the other. Unfortunately, the way it's happened in the schools, this mm -hmm. has been a big issue following on what you're saying about the school programs, is that the message that's traditionally given in school is that the technological, the Western type of knowledge is something that's taken on beyond and improved upon in traditional knowledge rather than being an extension uh, from a systems approach of human knowledge. It's ironic that the people that are most steeped in traditional, or in the, tr in the technological knowledge, we feel like we've gone beyond the need for traditional knowledge and that we, our, our, our religion has become science. The, the, real, the, the funny thing about this though is if you take that to the greatest extent, the most esoteric extent, for instance, in the last century, with, with uh, relativity. Let me, let me suggest we sure. pick that up at the, okay. after the break because we can talk about how to turn that into something practical okay, sure. that we could all advocate uh, right here at this table. Hello, I'm Martin Despang and I'm the host together with the one and only Ali Amashta and our show is called Urban Transcendence. And urban transcendence is about identifying where we have a unique situation of a vibrant city in one of the most beautiful natural environments. So how these two can coincide, sometimes conflict, how they could find reciprocity in the 21st century is what we're excited about. And we're planning on bringing in uh, a diverse body of, of guests, both from the arts and the science and the established and the wise and the emerging generation. So hope you will join us. We'll always be on on Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. So we spent the last half hour talking about different components or looking at systems from a different, different perspectives. We talked about the scientific aspect and the emerging knowledge of systems, mathematics, you might say, that leads to measurements and optimization and such. We talked about the need to include the cultural, civic, and governmental side in the equation, they have to be equal players. 
And her brings in the great wisdom of the past that, as you point out, Doug, may have been overridden mm -hmm. by well, a strong Western input. And now what we see is a recovery of some of that original thinking that might be, in fact, stronger. And the two can influence each other in a, in a positive way. So if we take those three vectors that are all pushing on this, uh, on this issue, and I'll interrupt myself and say one thing. I said the word vector. I, I mentioned earlier in the, in the show that uh, the information by James Glyke is a great way to understand where we've come from and where we're going. The word vector, the word force, the word energy, the word power, terms that we've all in the science world think have hard physical meanings with the equations that derive them, are actually have been stolen from the, the, the more metaphysical discussions and, and, and discussions in the past that, that preceded calculus, for example. Calculus came around that needed words to define certain mathematical characteristics, so it swiped them from the, the, the vocabulary and force, power, energy became physical parameters only by that. So uh, when I said vector, I, I apologize, but uh, we have three forcing functions that are pushing on this knowledge of the future. Mm -hmm. And Herb uh, brings in the, the aspect of perhaps there's a way to extract out of the traditional thinking different ways to think about this, different parametric views of what, how, how to get things done. And that leads to different forms of measurement. And if we can contrast those against the Western style that we were all raised in, we could do very well at learning something. So how would we structure a program like that? Maybe around the, the uh, Alawai watershed, maybe around Waikoloo Loco, which is Herb's place in Kaneohe, maybe around Heiia. How would we think about a K-12 program that would give us the way to get the kids going in this direction and we would learn from them? Well, one of the recent partnerships that the university and the Smithsonian Institute recently embarked on, and I've, I've been asked to be a part of that, um, helping to bring the K-12 aspect into uh, this new partnership, is uh, called the Marine Geo Site. Um, Geo standing for Global Earth Observatory. It was just signed in February uh, with uh, the new president, uh, Dave Lasner. And what it is is Smithsonian has chosen about 10 or 12 of these sites in the world to begin to collect data over the next 30 years to help inform and looking at both traditional knowledge as well as modern science, collecting data, asking the right questions, looking at history, looking at research, and uh, helping to inform them about maybe possible new solutions that we're not looking at in a more holistic way, gathering data from different sites. Uh, Kaneohe was, the Bay Area was chosen obviously because uh, they're very interested in uh, the microbiology, the corals, uh, and things like that, and how, you know, the foundations of the oceans and things like that, and what's occurring with ocean acidification. But more than that, it's, uh, it's looking at some of the cultural practices, too, of how people have managed, you know, the 11 ahupua'a that touch on Kaneohe Bay, and how that has been urbanized and, and, and some, some areas still are moving more back towards tra traditional kind of uh, knowledge and, and management style. So, and looking at all these compare and contrast opportunities. So I think, you know, from a scientific standpoint, to me, qualitative and quantitative data are equally important. And so, you know, some mm -hmm. of that, the oral history <coughs> and things like that are very important in trying to come up with now I think uh, a very more holistic look at all of the opportunities that are influencing that environment mm -hmm. collectively and seeing if we can take that knowledge and wisdom and be able to quantify it in a way and be able to analyze it in a way that we can uh, do a better job of being stewards of those places. Um, and I, I think, you know, um, using that sort of holistic approach is the way to go and then begin to look at how all of the elements that we talked about, Doug and Kent talked about here, all of the aspects of society uh, can, we can collectively now make an impact on some of these things that we want to see change in our own home environments. That's fantastic. And we could, uh, somebody here must have knowledge of a particular program or a particular area we could start and suggest to folks who are thinking about developing a program like this uh, at a prototype level, at a test case level. and push up. One thing comes to mind is, as we're saying all these issues, and I'm just thinking now of the, the, the tax map key. You know, we have all these nice boundaries we define right. for ourselves, and there's ownership, and there's 
rules that apply to land management. Uh, there may be different fiscal years involved and different uh, government agencies and such. You've got the state, we've got the city, we've got the federal government if there's been federal money involved in certain these things. So we, we've really lost the ability to, from a government structural perspective, to think in the way that we may need here to address this, these Akupuaha level thinking because we have all these boundaries that we've created. So one of the things we need to do is bring the legal or thinking process mm -hmm. into the game here in some way to have it realize and reflect upon the fact that there's uh, structural frameworks that have been created that may not be most opportune from the sustainability and resilience perspective. In your work, Doug, in development, have you, you must have come across that time and again in mm -hmm. government boundaries and different perspectives and right. different fiscal years and such Definitely. that are playing out. Definitely. Well, one of the uh, issues uh, talking about coming across that in, in development and practice is often development, because it's funded by governments or multilateral institutions, it tends to be that the development efforts are driven by and focused on the funders. They come up with, with programs that reflect governmental policies or bank policies, and they put those out, and the programs tend to be uh, structured in such a way that the people that, that are running programs tweak those or they structure those in such a way to reflect what the, the parameters are or the perspective is of, of those who are funding them. There's a certain natural logic to that. However, that's contradictory to what makes things sustainable. Right. And if we're talking about sustainability <coughs> really as something towards empowerment, uh, re really we're looking at resilience, we're looking at sustainability, we're looking at continuity in, t in, terms, to, in terms of empowerment. And so uh, there's a natural tendency to always focus on the source of where the funds are to put this in place, as opposed to focusing on what the results need to be on the stakeholders themselves. And this is uh, something that certainly we with the Development International are focused on right now. One of the, uh, our primary focus is on putting the locus of development on the stakeholders, even to the point of where it's the stakeholders that need to define what development means in their terms, because they are the ones that will sustain it. They are the ones that need to be provided continuity in order for there to be empowerment. And uh, uh, that's a very key thing to looking at the thinking. So it's a matter of uh, beginning at the source of where work and community needs are and what, what contri contributes to, to the continuity of the community. Really, when we think about the welfare of any group of people, whether it be the mo most microcosmic village level to the global level, it's we've been here for tens of thousands of years. So the issue is really continuity. We're talking about resilience against the challenges of nature, the challenges of politics, society, and, and nations. Resilience, and we're talking about sustainability to be able to continue, but it's really the continuity because even sustainability, which is now the big focus in development, it's really not about sustainability because what are we su sustaining? Are we sustaining the status quo? Are we sustaining a level of economic, what we consider to be economic empowerment? Or are we really trying to enhance cultures and communities, societies? And if we're doing that, then we're not just sustaining, we're making them resilient, but we're doing, we're, we're providing them the means to provide the continuity, however that culture, that society needs to continue. And since cultures are in fact dynamic, it's not a question of maintaining some predetermined set of values or, or cultural standards, but it's, it's invigorating and empowering communities to, to contribute proactively to that dynamic enculturation um, of their community, to continue with what makes what they identify that makes their community unique and to provide them the tools tools of empowerment to be able to continue and sustain that community. So being outcome driven, that is driven mm -hmm. by the desired outcome, whether we're coming at it from a scientific perspective, a cultural perspective, that's where we have to start. We have to start mm -hmm. with the desired end state and work backwards into the pieces that make that happen. And Definitely. that's certainly what, what history has all been about here in the Pacific. If it, weren't for that, sustainability would have ex extinguished the Pacific, entire Pacific. So somewhere in, in that thinking process, the traditional thinking process is buried a very strong outcome-driven 
continuity mm -hmm. concept. If we could pull that out yeah. in some way, and maybe we, not to challenge Waikulu Local, but Waikulu Local is very close to your heart and mine, Herb. Do you think, just as we took Jay Fidel out to the field and saw a bunch of UAVs some a couple weeks ago and that opened some thoughts, I wonder if we could do a field trip, this group here and maybe some more, sure. stand down at Waikulu Local and have this same discussion there, not three guys sitting in our, four guys sitting in our conference room here, but mm -hmm. out in the dirt mm -hmm. and understand that we don't quite know even know where the water sources are coming into Waikulu Loco. So we have some technical stuff we don't understand. We don't necessarily know what the water quality is. We, we don't, we probably need to create a vision of where it's going in the future, but we could, do, we could do an experiment on ourselves and take these thoughts and convert them to practical terms that could be carried forth. And Waikulu Loco is perfectly sited and, and, and sized for a school program. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. um, if we go back, you know, one of the, I'm thinking about this Olelo Noe, a uh, wide, ancient Hawaiian uh, wide scene, Mary Kavena Pukui, Aohe Pau Kaike Ikahalao Ho'okai. Not all knowledge is learned in one school. Mm -hmm. And that has resonated with us over and over and over and over. Um, and it also has really humbled us to know that we don't have all the knowledge. So the key point to that within this discussion, and you mentioned this earlier, Ted, is a concept of interdependence. So mm -hmm. I totally agree with Doug, you know, it's not about sustainability. What we need is in understanding these systems is that we need innovation within the systems because <coughs> it's the systems that's gonna help us make the changes that we need on a global level that where we wanna go. So the key word in this, uh, in all knowledge is not learning what school is that we need to partner and we need to know that interdependence just like in the old days everybody had gifts and talents and everybody contributed that gifts interdependently to a collective mm -hmm. and where we need to go in the future is to me the power of where we need to go is in understanding the dynamic of interdependence that will lead to new innovations of thought yeah within systems so that we can make the changes in the time that we have left because time is running out. Mm -hmm. So interdependence as a characterization of this, what the world we've fallen into, innovation as a way to react to that yeah. and based on the past we've, what we've done to ourselves and what we're about to do to ourselves, we need to get our arms around that. Right. And the K through 12 is the people who are gonna work this for us as we're exiting stage left at some point in time. So if we took those three things on and, and thought, about it, uh, thought about that with Waikulua Loco, mm -hmm. I would propose that we all go stand down there at Waikulua with your guidance and maybe get somebody from the school over as well yeah. uh, who's been involved. Let's just have this, that discussion. How do we measure interdependence? How do we measure the innovation? How do we know where the, where the loosely coupled, tightly coupled pieces are, where the influencers are strong? How do we get to that point of knowing what outcomes we want and then drive to them? I would like to have our team do that, and we'll bring, take Jay with us. Sounds good. We'll bring it back in as a, as a good. proposal. Let me know anytime. Okay. <laughs> we, I think we have some common thinking here, yeah. and I think the thing that you brought up, Herb, also uh, is a subject for a follow-on discussion, and that's the way language and different languages contribute to this understanding. We all speak English, Western language, Romance, which has little pieces in it. Yeah. Uh, Polynesian languages tend to be more holistic and much broader in thought, and there must be other languages as well. Sure. So having the linguistic component, linguistics control how we think, and that controls how we see something. So how do we make sure we bring that into the picture and make that broad enough uh, of a of a subject area that we don't lose something by not uh, attending to the way language influences our thinking. We have to be open to new learning and we have mm -hmm. to be open to <laughs> redefining yeah, right. what important yeah. words mean no matter what yeah. language. And isn't that where the K through 12 is? Because yes. they're the ones who are ready to accept new thoughts and new right. ideas and uh, where we may not They're not think. as brainwashed. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, what a way to put it. Okay, well, Gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, your wonderful insight today. And um, continuing from last time, we'll set, just like the billiard player leaves a ball on the table, we have that ball left on the table, interdependence, innovation for the next time. Uh, we have uh, no end of 
people who could think about this and contribute to it. The room's only big enough for four at a time. Uh, folks out there, uh, please give us uh, ideas through the uh, mechanisms that uh, Zuri discussed earlier. Love to hear your thoughts. Uh, love to hear your ideas of who else might contribute to this. But let's think of this from the perspective of the road to the future and technology being an art as one of the methods that we push that road to the future in the right direction. This is the ThinkTech Hawaii Studios in downtown Honolulu. Ted Ralston sitting in for Jay Fidel for a period of time to come here. And uh, with that, we bid you all a good weekend.